When it comes to being treated for prostate cancer, most men get whole gland therapy, so they're treating the entire prostate. But some men opt to have focal therapy. But the question is, what do you do if your PSA rises after focal therapy, and what is the process of monitoring whether focal therapy has been effective or not? So today we're interviewing Dr. Mark Schultz, who's a 30-year medical oncologist who's focused solely in prostate cancer, and he's going to talk about the monitoring process and what to do if the PSA does rise and there is a new tumor. So in today's video, we're talking about prostate cancer patients who have received focal therapy and now it their PSA is rising and it looks like the treatment uh, wasn't as effective as maybe they wanted it to be. So can we talk about the context a little bit? Can you talk about candidates for focal therapy? This issue, even of watching PSA levels after focal treatment, is different than if you've had regular radiation or surgery because the untreated prostate Focal treatment means you only treat a section of the prostate and you leave some of the prostate untreated. The untreated prostate makes more PSA. So a normal PSA after focal treatment may be one or two. And in my opinion, PSA as a standalone monitoring tool for these people is inadequate. Uh, and we routinely order annual MRIs in our patients that have had focal treatment. The whole idea of focal treatment is that now with modern imaging, we have a much better sense of where the tumor is in the prostate, and there are tools that can subselectively treat a section of the prostate. Historically, prostate cancer treatment has involved either removing the whole gland or treating the whole gland due to uncertainties as to where the tumor was and secondary tumors and these sorts of things. Uh, that, uh, as I said, has changed now that we have better imaging, better staging tools, and the possibility of just treating a section of the gland is very attractive because it's less likely to lead to long-term side effects. I know that we have other videos further discussing focal therapies and the various types and kind of the ins and outs and comparisons, but for this video, could you just list out some of the focal therapies that patients may have gotten that they may find themselves in this situation? The idea of focal therapy is pretty much as I've outlined, but there are many different tools that can be used to selectively destroy a section of the prostate and eradicate the cancer. Freezing, called cryotherapy, high-intensity focused ultrasound, which sort of burns the tumor out, Tulsa Pro or freehand HIFU treatment, uh, electroporation, where they put electrodes on each side of the tumor, run electricity between them, uh, and literally electrocute the tumor. Uh, radiation can be used for this. Laser treatment uh, is available. The methodology, in my opinion, is less of an issue than the skill of the doctor doing it because we're talking about targeting a very small area and precision is incredibly important and patient selection is incredibly important because not everyone's going to be a candidate for, for focal therapy if for example they have a spot on both sides of the prostate focal therapy is not going to be practical. So as you said that the PSA with focal therapy typically is a baseline is like one or two. So if a patient sees it going higher and they do have, you know, that prostate tissue left over, what is the process that they need to um, undergo in order to look if there's further cancer? Well, now that we have PSMA PET scans, it's gotten a lot more straightforward. Uh, if someone has a higher PSA, it could be from prostatitis or non-cancer related etiology. PSMA PET scans generally make it a lot easier. Patients do need to be aware of the fact that 10% of men have variants of prostate cancer that don't make PSMA. But uh, for 90% of men, if there is any cancer present, it'll show up on a PSMA PET scan. And uh, it's a nice way to confirm that uh, there's no activity. We typically don't use routine PSMA PET scans in men who are under just surveillance. We might do it if someone has a very high PSA and we're trying to explain that. More typically, we rely upon MRI and uh, try and get accurate pictures of the untreated prostate to make sure there's no new tumor showing up or that the doctor who did the focal therapy didn't miss the original tumor and therefore persistent disease is present. Before I get to my next question, I just wanted to remind you that in September, we're having an in-person prostate cancer patients and caregivers conference, and it's a great way to get help in person. Also, if you would like to donate and support our channel, you can do so at pcri.org forward slash donate, and please click that subscribe button because when you do this, it pushes our videos out to other people who need help when it comes to prostate cancer. Now back to my conversation with Dr. Schultz. 
One of the things that I see come up in the comments section, especially for focal therapy patients, is because they see PSA fluctuating, they get concerned at what point do I need to start looking for further cancer and get a PSMA scan. So how far or how high should the PSA rise before you would say, yes, this is the point we need to take action? Well, I would reiterate that as a, at a baseline, in men that have had focal treatment, we're ordering annual MRI. Well-performed MRIs are quite accurate and therefore if well-performed MRI doesn't show any cancer in the prostate, uh, then uh, unless the PSA is really seriously misbehaving, let's say it's going up to three or four or five, uh, we're not thinking of concerns about uh, another cancer. There is, of course, always a possibility of delayed metastasis from the original tumor. PSMA PET scans really shine as a wonderful way to make sure that that has not occurred as well. From the get-go, we're getting annual MRIs. We start 12 months after the focal tra treatment has been performed. And then if things are all clear and if the PSA is holding in the one to two range, we don't get too concerned. If it starts going above one to two, then we will typically will get a PET scan. What about in situations where a patient is, you know, has had focal therapy, their PSA is rising, they get the MRI and there's a new tumor. Can they get focal therapy again? Do they need to have whole, you know, gland radiation? I think a lot of patients are wondering, I had focal, I'd like to get focal again because I was able to, put, to preserve um, some function there, but do I need to get the whole thing treated, whether by surgery or radiation? It comes on a case by case basis. Men that have larger prostates are are more likely to be able to do a second focal treatment. Men with have smaller prostates, it's possible that as much as half of their gland was treated the first time when they had their focal therapy, and therefore a second focal therapy on the other side could easily entail covering the whole prostate at that point. The idea of doing focal therapy in the first place, uh, sometimes I think patients and doctors figure, well, if we don't get it all the first time, we can always come back and do it again. But in my experience, that's a very, very uh, discouraging occurrence for people who go through a rather complex process, search out someone who's purportedly really good at this, undergo the treatment itself, and then are faced with the possibility that they missed or didn't get all the cancer. What this argues for is that process of selection, the type of treatment and the doctor treat, uh, doing the focal therapy, is incredibly important to find the absolute best uh, and most skilled doctor possible to ensure that it's a one and done because treating people for relapse is more difficult. Focal therapy itself is a custom treatment, but then if you've got someone that has a partially treated prostate coming back for more treatment, it gets even more complicated and the, and the possibility of side effects uh, complications goes up when you're retreating someone compared to entering into this for the first time. So what about in situations where patients don't have localized disease anymore and it has metastasized, whether maybe there's a spot or two in their bones or in the lymph nodes and now um, they need to get treated? Are they immediately going to go to hormone therapy? Like what are those next steps? Well, in the old days, it was always, yes, hormone therapy for metastatic disease was a foregone conclusion. The um, We're learning now with new PSMA PET scans that, especially in the more elderly, that maybe if there's only like one or two lymph nodes uh, where the disease is manifesting, uh, they can undergo radiation therapy with no hormone treatment to spare them the side effects of the hormone treatment. PSMA technology is such a big advance and we're finding these metastatic lesions at a much earlier stage than we used to. Historically, if something showed up on a CAT scan or bone scan, it meant that there were probably spots all over the body and the policy therefore uniformly was always to give hormone treatment, sometimes even chemotherapy treatment. That can still be the case in people with more advanced disease or perhaps in younger people uh, where you want to use multimodality therapy. But in the more elderly, it may be feasible just to simply radiate the lymph nodes and see how things go. I think some of the concerns from people online is that if they treat it with spot radiation, you know, what about micrometastases, things that are running through their blood? And with these hormone therapies, they're systemic. They run through their blood and they kind of treat, um, hopefully treat micrometastatic disease. So um, is there a certain monitoring system that people need to go through in order to make sure that they are watching it closely? Right. There's tension between those two schools of thought. And I'd say you want to use uh, combination therapy in people who are younger, who appear to have faster growing disease or more extensive disease. And you want to think about using single modality radiation in people who have uh, maybe just one or two spots. Uh, it's taken a long time for them to show up. It appears that their PSA is moving slowly and they have indolent, low grade, slow growing disease. So you have to characterize it based on these two different uh, 
patterns that uh, are usually apparent because these people have been under observation for a while. You can characterize them depending on how aggressive the situation is. So it sounds like we're talking about three different types of relapses. It would seem like we're talking about the possibility that there's a relapse from the same location because it wasn't treated properly. There's a possible relapse due to a new tumor on the prostate or even a relapse when it comes to bone metastases or lymph node metastases. What imaging modalities do you use in order to delineate between those? Uh, we rely heavily on MRI, ultrasound, and PSMA PET scans. And I think it is important to make this distinction because honestly, if someone has gone through focal treatment and it comes to your awareness that the spot that they originally intended to eradicate wasn't completely eradicated, it sounds like it's time to look for a different doctor to do the next treatment. I don't really see the rationale of going back to a physician that wasn't able to get the job done properly the first time. It's very difficult to know who's good at these focal treatments. And it is a skill procedure. Uh, and there's a, a varying uh, spectrum of skills in the field. When you're dealing with a situation where they didn't get it all the first time, it's probably time to consult a different physician. If the quote relapse isn't really a relapse, if there's a brand new spot on the other side of the prostate, which prostate cancer is common and this can occur, and this is one of the reasons that we get MRIs every year is we know that new spots could potentially show up. Uh, and if the original tumor is completely gone, it sounds like you validated that the physician that did the first treatment did their job beautifully. The fact that there's a new spot is just part of being a human and uh, being at risk for the most common cancer on the face of the earth, which is prostate cancer for at least in the United States. And then the third category of spots outside the prostate, that has to do uh, with, you know, men who are newly diagnosed, there's a risk calculation that goes on based on the Gleason score, the size of the tumor, other factors to decide if systemic therapy is necessary, prophylactic lymph node radiation in, in the pelvic region is necessary to reduce the risk of systemic relapse. A botched job initially, a brand new primary on the other side of the prostate, or systemic metastatic disease are the three different categories. So if you had focal therapy for a higher grade disease, so maybe you're in Gleason's, you know, uh, eights, nines, and tens, um, and I know tens are rare, but in those situations, are you more likely to metastasize and is it harder to get all of the cancer if you are going to choose focal therapy with that initial uh, treatment? It's an important question because in my judgment, modern treatments, and I listed them earlier, cryotherapy, radiation, whatnot, are more than able to eradicate the tumor that they're aimed at. And so the problem with systemic relapses uh, in higher Gleason score patients, you can have micrometastatic disease, is that you can't see it and you can't aim a treatment at it. I think sometimes there's a thought out there in the, in the industry that if it's a higher grade lesion that you can't do focal treatment, that you need to be more thorough and treat the whole prostate. Um, I disagree, I think that it's a, not an issue of treating the whole prostate. It's, it's being willing to monitor the untreated prostate and possibly implement further treatment later if a new spot showed up. When we think of Gleason 9s, 8s, 9s, and 10s spreading, we don't think of them spreading to the rest of the gland. They can grow big enough to be in several portions of the gland, but you can see that on a scan. Spreading is where it goes to the lymph nodes or the bones. So men who want to prioritize maintaining sexual function and reducing side effects and for that reason want to pursue focal therapy. Um, I don't see any reason to veer away from focal therapy in men with higher Gleason scores if other factors indicate that they can have focal therapy, that is, you know, unilateral disease that's visible on an MRI. The, but I do know that in the industry there's a general sense of focal therapy is only reserved for like Gleason 7, which uh, I don't understand given the fact that treatment the treatments that I've listed are more than able to eradicate these higher grade diseases. It's just we can never 100% promise that there won't be a little speck somewhere that's already out there undetected on scans. So I hope I, I been able to make that distinction between these, uh, these different schools of thought and that my personal opinion is that focal therapy is okay for high grade disease. Uh, it doesn't mean that you would do focal therapy as a standalone. If someone had a Gleason 9 with a PSA of 20, and is undergoing focal treatment, we would argue that that person getting focal treatment should also get prophylactic radiation to their pelvic lymph nodes and should undergo hormone treatment for a period of time to reduce the likelihood of a relapse systemically. 
not, in, not a relapse in the prostate. That's dependent on the quality of the doctor doing the focal treatment. One of the key points that Dr. Scholz mentioned in the video was how important it is to pay attention to who is doing the procedure. And if you already had focal therapy and maybe there is a recurrence in the same spot, maybe don't go to the same physician. Now, a lot of times patients ask, how do I research the physician? What do I do? We always talk about centers of excellence and we talk about, you know, making sure that you go to somebody who's really experienced. Well, a good way to research that is to call the office and ask them how many procedures has this physician done? So whether it's Tulsa Pro or any of the other procedures that Dr. Schultz mentioned, um, how many do they have under their belt? You know, you don't want to be necessarily maybe some of the early cases because maybe the doctor's still learning how to do it. Another thing to be aware of is that a lot of times these specialty facilities who do focal therapy or they buy these big machines, and this goes not just in focal therapy, but in prostate cancer in general, you know, they buy a machine and they need to pay for it. So they put a lot of marketing into it and this is what their whole center does. And it is their job to sell you on this procedure. And it's not that this procedure necessarily is a bad one. In fact, it could be a very good one. But you wanna pay attention that you're getting the procedure that's right for you, that you get multiple doctors involved in your medical case and that you're getting multiple opinions and you're weighing all of your options. Another thing with choosing somebody to do a focal therapy procedure is, you know, see if they've written research papers. And if they maybe have written a research paper and maybe they're the second or third person listed, who's the first person listed? And it's tremendously helpful to kind of read what their data says and see how involved they are in the process of having these treatments done. Another key factor that I think is important is researching the reviews of these doctors online and maybe joining a virtual support group, even just searching the doctor's name in a virtual support group because it can be helpful to kind of see what the other patients who have experienced this and what their outcomes were. I think oftentimes patients who opt for focal therapy, there's a lot of excitement that they can preserve sexual function or urinary function to a certain extent. But I think it's important even in focal situations to ask ahead of time, what are the side effects I can expect? If I do expect, you know, have these side effects, how can I take care of them and make sure that you create a game plan? The other thing to do, even if you have focal therapy and your PSA does go down and you just stay in remission, that's fantastic. But always have a game plan of what the next step is should prostate cancer come back. It's not really a pessimistic mindset. It's just making sure that you have a game plan from the outset to make sure that if that situation does occur, you already have a plan in place and it's just a really great way to take care of your mental health and emotional health through that process. If you would like more information about anything that Dr. Schultz talked about in this video, you can contact our helpline at pcri.org forward slash helpline. These are prostate cancer patients who have had quite a lot of experience in prostate cancer, not only because they had it, but because they've been trained by our medical team and they've counseled other patients who have been through similar situations as you. Uh, you can either contact that by, you can contact them on our website, but you can talk to them either by phone or by email and a lot of patients find it tremendously helpful so they can ask specific questions about their case. Now, if you would like more information about prostate cancer in general, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. We publish new videos like this every week. And please remember, most of all, you're not alone.